Thanks very much uh, for uh, coming to this presentation and thank you to the organizers for putting together such an excellent panel on, on civilian agency in conflict zones. Um, it's a pleasure to contribute to this uh, discussion. Um, my title today is Ceasefires and Civilian Protection Monitoring Evidence from Myanmar. And in this presentation, I focus on civilian agency in the form of civilian protection monitoring. Civilian protection monitoring is a form of protective civilian agency. And in the context of Myanmar, at least, it emerged uh, in the context of ceasefire monitoring in Myanmar's com complex conflict landscape after the democratic opening back in 2011. You may remember that uh, in the early years after Myanmar's opening in 2011 uh, and Myanmar's transition back then, there was high optimism and high hope for that uh, it would be possible to bring peace uh, to the many decades old uh, insurgencies in the borderlands, that it would be possible to negotiate an overall comprehensive peace accord uh, and to consolidate a democratic regime. So many international organizations and donors rushed into uh, Myanmar to support that nascent peace process. And uh, I think due in part to the complexity of Myanmar's conflict landscape, the country became somewhat of a laboratory for local peace building approaches. Um, you may or you may not remember that uh, Myanmar in 2015 had a complex conflict landscape. You don't fully have to understand uh, the map uh, on the left side to you, but the main message here is that in 2015, um, there was a so-called nationwide ceasefire agreement. However, it was only signed by some of the very many rebel groups uh, in Myanmar. And it is important to know that the strongest rebel groups in Myanmar never signed that 2015 uh, ceasefire agreement. However, internationally, that ceasefire agreement was very much lauded. There was high hope, again, uh, for this being uh, the start towards a comprehensive peace process. Um, but, of course, um, the conflict landscape in Myanmar was extremely fragmented uh, in terms of rebel groups. Um, so back in 2011, during the transition of Myanmar, the European Union and other donors uh, st started funding so-called civilian ceasefire monitoring networks. It was in support uh, of bilateral ceasefire agreements. Some of these uh, ceasefires culminated in the 2015 NCA, Nationwide Peace Accord. Um, and with that money from donors, international NGOs, and local civil society organizations trained civilians in Myanmar's borderlands and the conflict regions to monitor ceasefire agreements. And the idea was that early civilian involvement would improve protection of civilians, so these conflict zones, these borderlands, are generally areas or rare areas where international actors had very limited access. So international presence to support and protect civilians was hardly possible. And because of that background, um, NGOs and CSOs trained these civilians. Um, and it was hoped that early civilian involvement would overall support um, the local peace process, that it would bring women into local peace building um, early on again, and that overall, all this local agency and local civilian protection would uh, be support for a long time uh, sustainable peace process. Now, unfortunately, um, as we know, Myanmar's peace process failed. It ended abruptly last year um, with the military coup in February. And we know with hindsight, of course, um, that international support for local civilian protection and peace building did not lead to peace. And um, as many analysts um, have published by now, um, under the circumstances in Myanmar also could not have been expected to lead uh, to peace. However, I think uh, that the case of Myanmar does offer some important lessons um, about the potential and about the limitations of civilian monitoring to improve the protection of civilians in remote and difficult to access conflict zones where international actors could not directly intervene to protect civilians. This presentation is uh, based on a recently published or forthcoming work um, I will not discuss in depth um, the literature um, behind the findings or the research design. Uh, in the interest of time, I will only give you the main arguments and some of the main findings. Uh, and I think um, the, the sources uh, for the findings are available online. I'd like to point out uh, a very exciting uh, new book forthcoming uh, next year on a civilian protective agency, co-edited with, among others, Juan Mazudo, who is also sitting here in the audience. And uh, some of the work uh, is also forthcoming in that book. So civilian protection monitoring. What is it? It basically means um, that civilians 
and uh, CSOs uh, um, come together basically, um, are trained uh, to monitor ceasefires in the absence of international monitoring that could have taken place. Um, but because Myanmar ceasefires either failed very quickly or were dysfunctional from the start, civilian monitors were trained by CSOs, but they were never really in a position to monitor ceasefires. So what these civilians did, who had the networks to monitor and the knowledge to monitor, is instead use the networks and the knowledge to monitor the protection of civilians and to overall contribute to a better protection of civilians on the ground. So civilian monitors monitored conflict dynamics, um, civilian harm and human rights violations. They reported them uh, to state actors, but also very importantly to humanitarian and peace building actors. Uh, and with that, they provided humanitarian actors who did not themselves have much access in the conflict zones with crucial information to better serve civilian populations. Uh, civilian monitors trained civilian and self-protection strategies and overall also supported civilians in safer displacement practices. Safer displacement simply means more coordinated displacement and information uh, to humanitarian actors to better reach um, quickly uh, displaced populations. And overall, in some instances at least, they were able through their monitoring and reporting to seek redress for civilian abuse. Uh, I present uh, three arguments based on this work. Um, the first one is civilian capacity and conflict conditions both shape and constrain a civilian protection monitoring. So the analysis here focuses on how can civilian protection monitoring work in different conflict zones, what are the potentials, in what ways is it innovative, but also very much what are the limitations of local agency. And with civilian capacity, I mean the knowledge of civilians, um, the networks that they have, the institutions, uh, and the experience of how to act in a conflict zone overall. There's um, excellent work on all of these uh, points, some of them I um, cite here on the slide. And with conflict conditions, I mean the overall context. Um, so factors such as armed group sensitivity to civilian preferences, restraint uh, among uh, armed actors, but also institutions uh, to punish um, abuses of the civilian population. And we know for a fact that in the context of Myanmar, the Myanmar army is not one that has institutionalized restraint um, against, uh, in terms of violence against civilians. On the contrary, it has been a highly abusive uh, military and uh, Myanmar's counterinsurgency in the border zones um, has been extremely uh, deadly for civilians. My second argument is that civilian protection monitoring can effectively contribute to the immediate protection of civilians in context of open and active conflict. Um, I will give you more details on that in a moment. But importantly, it is less impactful in so-called no war gray zone situations. And I think that's an important point when we discuss local agency and local peace building, because much of the local peace building is expected to precisely take place in these gray zones and transitions from conflict uh, to peace building. And there are high expectations on civilian agency contributing uh, to civilian protection and uh, peace building. And I will explain in a moment some of the factors that make that very difficult. Lastly, civilian protective agency is a form of political agency, and that should be very clear uh, from the start. A political agency means uh, it is rooted in certain worldviews, values, and norms, but also group interests, of course, and group mobilization. And as political agency, it is contested, and it can generate resistance, not just among armed actors and political actors, but also, importantly, among some population groups. So for example, in, my, uh, in Myanmar, also among some of the populations that were supposed to be served and protected by these civilian monitors and their protection monitoring. Very briefly on the research process, um, I did field work um, with a local team uh, back mainly in 2018. Um, I've been involved in researching uh, in Myanmar since uh, 2016. Field work primarily took place uh, in, uh, in the north, in Kachin State, um, and the uh, border uh, to China. Uh, Kachin State is, has one of the longest standing um, insurgencies uh, with a very strong rebel group, the Kachin Independence Army. And I compare the case of Kachin State uh, to Karen State in the southeast on the border to Thailand, which equally has a very long-running insurgency um, and a very strong and cohesive um, rebel group. And both rebel groups are very strongly rooted um, in the local populations. The uh, main difference here is that Kachin State did have a very long ceasefire 
uh, about 17 years until 2011 with the Myanmar government and the Myanmar army, and so had been relatively peaceful until Myanmar's transition, but that ceasefire broke down in 2011. And in 2012, um, Karen state uh, and the Karen Independence Army negotiated a ceasefire. So basically, they flipped. One state had a ceasefire, while the other state had active conflict, um, which is not surprising because it's been a long-standing uh, strategy by the Myanmar government to play out rebel groups against each other in ceasefire negotiations. And it's one of the main reasons why the civilians could hardly monitor uh, ceasefires and could hardly contribute uh, to the protection of civilians. Very briefly, uh, some of the empirics on this uh, comparison. Kachin state, um, as I just said, um, had a failed ceasefire in 2011. It did have another ceasefire back in 2013, but it, was, uh, it failed uh, completely very quickly, basically. And so, as I said earlier, in 2011, the EU, as a donor, put funding into building these civilian ceasefire monitoring networks, to some extent copying some successful models uh, from Mindanao in the Philippines. So NGOs and CSOs came in, trained civilians in 2015, brought some of them also to the Philippines to learn from that uh, example. But in 2015, the Kachin ceasefire had already um, broken down completely. So they essentially started civilian ceasefire monitoring at a time when there was no ceasefire to monitor. But Civilians did learn from these trainings and they appreciated these networks. So what they did was adapt the ceasefire monitoring knowledge and network, the infrastructure that they were given to some extent with very little funding. This is all volunteer um, based work. So they adapted that knowledge and they used it for protection monitoring. They, uh, protection monitoring in terms of, as I said earlier, uh, disseminating information to civilian populations, how to protect themselves better and collecting information for humanitarian actors, how to serve the civilian population better. So overall, in Kachin State, which had a very strong uh, monitoring network, um, the monitors were able to use international expertise uh, for the betterment of local conflict conditions. Now, by contrast, Karen State um, had a ceasefire from uh, 2012 onwards, uh, and the Karen Independence Army actually also signed the NCA in 2015. So it didn't have open conflict during the ceasefire monitoring period, but it was a highly militarized uh, environment with ongoing high abuse against the civilian population. Um, that means uh, that the Myanmar army remained uh, stationed uh, in many contested areas um, of Kachin state. Um, equally, the rebel group it did not give up uh, territorial control. You had a different governance system, um, the rebel groups governing their own territory and the Myanmar governing, uh, government governing other territories. And within the context of that militarized uh, complex environment uh, and the different um, objectives of armed groups and many militia groups that were also present, uh, civilian monitors were very much restricted in the work that they could do to protect civilians. And that was first and foremost because no armed group really had an interest in making that ceasefire work. There was high skepticism among both uh, the Karen Independence Army and also the Karen population in the peace process. Um, and that's why there was no functioning ceasefire um, architecture. And so without, I'm almost concluding, without a functioning ceasefire monitoring architecture, civilian monitors could also not use that architecture to report on civilian abuse uh, and to protect the civilian population. So overall, despite the more peaceful uh, conditions on the ground, civilian monitors were unable to protect civilians from abuse, primarily non-lethal abuse, such as land grabbing by armed actors and displacement, forced displacement, uh, in the context of a stored peace process. Conclusions, very quickly. First of all, civilian protection monitoring can make an important contribution to the protection of civilians, but only under specific conflict conditions. Um, second, international peacebuilding actors can strengthen civilian capacity, uh, and I would say many NGOs um, are internationally very good at it, um, and they're not doing it uh, only in Myanmar. They've also run uh, successful programs in other countries, such as Colombia. But they are often much less effective in changing armed actor rationale, uh, changing preferences and overall conflict conditions to make civilian agency work better. And lastly, or my third point, civilian adaptation. Um, of external peace-building knowledge to local circumstances was one of the key factors that mitigated the risks for civilian involvement uh, and the potential risks of moral hazard. And I'm happy to say more uh, in the Q&A about that. And uh, finally, adopting a focus on local peace-building is important, but it does not guarantee that international actors can somehow scale up local civilian protection uh, and conflict mit uh, mitigation practices. Thank you. <laughs>